as we continue thinking about that concept of surrender, <clears throat> we might think that we would find that word all over the New Testament. But depending on your translation, you might not find it at all, or it may just be found one time. Yet certainly the idea is just present throughout, as I hope we're going to be able to see in the next few minutes. As we mentioned, surrender is usually not a popular thought. If there's a nation, and the nation's been fighting a war, and it's on the losing side, and the other nation is just ready to decimate it, a lot of times the leader of the victorious nation will say, here are the terms of unconditional surrender, and they're never good. It means you're either going to have to give something up, something that you have that you're going to give over to this leader, or you're going to have to give something back. So maybe there was a war 100, 200 years ago, and you're going to have to cede the property back to them. But whatever the case, it's always the concept of giving something up, giving back, delivering over. And when we think about it in those terms, the idea of surrendering to God might not be something that we would think about in a very positive sense. But I hope we will this morning as we look at some ideas associated with surrender. But let's just begin at, at the very beginning with this idea of what exactly it is that we're being called on to surrender. Now as we answer that question, we need to start on the first page of the Bible. Because it's here that God says... I'm giving you life. And that's what all this is going to be about. He says, I'm giving you life, this life that belongs to me. Yet as we think about that term life, sometimes it's not a real easy idea to figure out exactly what we mean here. We certainly can think about it in the terms of the physical process. When God said He breathed into the nostrils of the human the breath of life, and man became a living being... It's kind of like the body, this, this body that had been made from the dust animates. It's interesting that we even use that for non-living things sometimes. Uh, if there's an old car that you've been trying to get running and finally it hits and fires up, uh, you might say, well, there's life left in her yet. Well, that's the idea that we're drawing from our bodies. It's the physical process, but yet we use that term in other ways as well. Sometimes we'll use it as the series of events in one's existence. So maybe as we get older, we look back, and if things have gone really well, we'll say, well, I've had a good life. Or it could be the negative. We could say, I've not had a good life. But what we're doing is we're putting all of these events together, linking uh, our childhood years to when we go off and get a job, get married, have kids, whatever. We're saying that's our life. But yet there's a third way I think we use it also, and that's the idea of ownership or control. So if someone says, this is how you need to act, this is what you need to do, there might be a rebellion to that, and the other person says, it's my life. I'll live it like I want. And so you take the three ideas and you're saying, all of this belongs to me. I'm in control of these things. And I don't know that when we talk about giving life back to God, that we've got to figure out which of these it is. In fact, I think it's just the opposite, that we're looking at this compilation of the three ideas of what life is all about, of what He's given to us. And as we think about surrendering our definition to give back or to give over, what we're saying is, is that I'm willing to return to you what's been given to me. The life that you have given me, the physical life, the ability to interact, the ability to make decisions, the ownership that I have, I'm returning all of that back to you. And that's appropriate, isn't it? Because he's the one who owned it in the first place. I think about as Paul was preaching to the Athenians. Here is a, a group of pagans. And he's having to go back and, and, you know, he can't start with Moses and preach to them. He's having to go back to the very beginning of things. And as he's making the contrast between God and idolatry, he says, nor is he talking about God served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he gives, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. 
Paul says the God that I'm talking about, the God who I want you to know, is the God who has all of this in His hand, and He has since the very beginning of time. And so when we take all of that together and we go back to the book of Genesis and we're reading those earliest days of the the story of mankind, as we look in the garden, as we look at the relationship, God has said, I'm giving my images, my human creation, this life for a divine purpose. The idea that He presents in all of this is that I want to be in fellowship with you. That's why we're here. Because God says, I want you and I to have this family relationship, to be in fellowship together. But what happens? Well, the temptation from the very beginning forward has always been to seize this life and to use it for our own purposes. And so whether we're talking about Adam and Eve or whether we're talking about Cain or Lamech or the world of Noah's day or the people of Babel or wherever we go in the story of the Bible or beyond into just general human history, the temptation has always been kind of associated with that third definition that we use of this belongs to me, I'm going to use it like I want to. Whatever I want to do, that's what I'm going to do. And thus, that takes us off into sin. It takes us out of that fellowship with God. It removes the bond that He desired for us to have together since the very beginning. But what He's saying is, if you'll listen to my terms of surrender, what I'm desiring for you to do, that's going to be very beneficial to you, is to give that back to me. And what God has promised in that, is that those terms are very much going to be for our benefit. So there we've got the idea of what's being surrendered, of what's being given back. And we look at this passage that we we alluded to just a few minutes ago, where Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. That concept of the daily carrying of our cross is just simply, we're taking on Jesus. We're living every day with Jesus, come what may. Whatever that's going to bring, we're going to accept it. And he says, if you will accept those terms, these very generous terms of surrender, that you will give your life up, in a sense, to give it back to God, God is going to say that is the very way that your life is going to be saved. And so kind of like King Zedekiah where God says, if you'll just listen to me, I'm going to give you your life. I'm going to let you live. That's what he tells us, not in the physical sense that we'll never die, but in the eternal sense that what he has given to us at the beginning is going to be protected from here on out. That's the promise that He's given to us. So when we understand what exactly it is we're surrendering, we then need to figure out how this surrender is going to work. But again, we need to do a little background on this. We think about a grand irony that's associated with all of this, that Jesus Himself surrendered. When you think about His life story, you see that he's surrendering to his own death, voluntarily going to the cross to die by the hands of his own creation so that his own creation can have life. Jesus did not die by accident. There was no thought that that I don't know what's going on. In fact, all through the storyline of Jesus, he tells us it's coming. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer there. I'm going to be raised after three days. And so what we see in him is a picture of what he was willing to do that he's calling on us to do. He's saying, if you'll think about my life, I'm giving you the illustration of what surrender looks like. Because it wasn't only to His human creation that that took place, although that was part of it. It's also going to be to His Father. 
Let's look at those two ideas together. In Acts chapter 2, verse 23, as Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost, he says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. The delivered up here could easily be the word surrender. Same idea, same definition. So this Jesus surrendered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. And that's what Peter's going to focus on here coming up as they ask him questions about what they need to do. He says, you killed the Son of God, and here's the response to that. But let's also make sure we're understanding the place of God in this. Because in this surrendering, Jesus is also surrendering His will to the Father's will. I don't think He's forced to do this. This is not a a thing where He absolutely 100% has to comply or else. This is a voluntary submission. And the Apostle Paul makes that clear to us when he says in Philippians 2, beginning in verse 6, who, talking about Jesus, though He was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Everything we see about Jesus shows an attitude of saying, I'm willing to surrender for the best terms possible. Because in this surrender, I'm giving my life to the Father. I'm showing Him my obedience. But I'm also giving my life so that others can live, so that others can be restored to that fellowship that God desired from the very beginning of time. And so then when I take that example of Jesus and I see here is the perfect selfless one, who is willing to surrender, I look at my own life, which is far from being selfless. And I understand the good terms God has given me, but I also understand that in my surrender, it means I'm going to kill off the mindset of I get to define what's good. Think again about our third definition. I'm in control. No, that's not the case. What was the very first temptation? It was the temptation to say God doesn't know what He's talking about. That there are other things that you should be doing that are better, and that's what has led mankind off track since that point. And thus, if I'm going to surrender to God, it means I'm killing off that mindset of saying, I get to decide what's right and what's wrong. Let me illustrate it from Romans chapter 6. I'll encourage you to go ahead and turn over there. Romans chapter 6. As we think about the Apostle discussing terms of salvation here, let's begin down in verse 3. He says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried therefore with Him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. Let's stop there for just a minute. Paul says when you go down into the waters of baptism, unity is occurring. You're being reunited with God. That fellowship bond that had been broken when sin came along, he says you're going into the water and it's going to be there in the water that you're united with Jesus. You die with Jesus. You're raised with Jesus. But let's continue to see what else is going to happen. Because there's another death that we'll see described here. Verse 6. He says, We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin. You see, when I die with Jesus and I'm resurrected with Jesus, Paul goes on to say, what's dying here is that self-will. 
That idea of saying, I can decide what's good. I can decide what's bad. I can decide what's right. I can decide what's wrong. He says that old self, with all of its selfishness, with all of its wicked intent, with all of its desires to be away from God, you're, you're nailing it to the cross and you're done with that kind of lifestyle. So what we're seeing is that this surrender is going to take place in the waters of baptism where I'm saying to God, I'm ready ready to meet you on your terms. I'm ready for your grace. I'm ready for your mercy. I'm showing you my faith that it's here. You're going to kill off this old man of sin. You're going to, to erase all of those sins that I've had in the past based on that. And that I can be raised to be like Jesus Christ. And thus in baptism. What I'm doing is I'm giving back control to God. I'm saying to the Lord, I understand what it was supposed to be like from the very beginning, and now that's exactly what I want. And so in living for Him, as Paul will later say, or earlier in, uh, sorry, got that right the first time, later in the book of Romans say, you therefore become a living sacrifice to God holy and acceptable to Him. You're no longer conformed to this world, but you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? Because in the renewal, you're putting on the mind of Christ. So that's how this surrender works. I understand what Jesus has done, selflessly surrendered to the Father's will, selflessly surrendered to humans, lost His life, took the curse, raised from the dead, so that I too could live in Him. Now, maybe the most pressing question for us this morning is this. Why is that surrender so difficult? Now, if you're not a Christian, maybe it's your first time visiting with us, we're happy you're here. So glad for you to be present with us. And maybe some of what I've talked about you've heard a little of, you're, you're kind of fuzzy on it, I'd be glad to talk with you about it. But the vast majority of people here this morning you know what surrender is all about. You know what's been done. You, you understand all of that. But sometimes we find that surrendering our will to God's will can be a very difficult thing. And I believe that if we wanted to say the number one reason, the biggest reason that it's so difficult is because we typically do not like giving up control, do we? You think about the nations. Two nations go to war. And these nations will fight it out. They'll lose hundreds, maybe thousands of their own countrymen as they battle all of this out. For what purpose? So that they do not have to give up something. Maybe it's a land holding. Maybe it's freedom. Nations don't like to do that. But even on an individual level, we don't care for it too much, do we? Sometimes as we get older, we need our, our adult children to help us out. And sometimes what that involves is signing over a power of attorney to a child <laughs> and saying, you've got full access to all my accounts, everything. There are very few people who enjoy doing that. Because what that saying is, is I'm at a point in my life where I realize I've got to give something up. I've got to give up some independence. I've got to give up some of, of my individualism for the help of another. And so whether it's nations, whether it's individuals, whatever the case, we find that that's very difficult for us to do. Yet, what we understand is this control, if we're going to give it up, the only thing that's going to make it better is if we have peace of mind that the one to whom this control is being given has our best interest at heart. And that's why we can sign it over to a child who loves us, right? We may not like it that much. We may feel like we're giving something up, but yet we realize this son or this daughter is going to treat me the right way. Let's think about that with God. I think one of the reasons surrender is so difficult is because we don't always trust that God knows best. Now, we'll say we do, for certain. Yet, to understand whether we truly believe that or not is to look at how we behave ourselves. Let me illustrate that from the people of Israel. 
I want to look first of all back to Exodus chapter 15 where Moses is talking to the people and he's telling them about the covenant and he's saying this is how the covenant will be successful. He says, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do everything which is right in His eyes and give ear to His commandments, and keep all His statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Pay particular attention where he says, you do what's right in God's eyes. That's a covenant people. That's a people who says, we're going to give up our control, or at least our perceived control of things, Because we trust that what God sees is best. Now let's contrast that with something Moses is going to say near the end of his life. When we go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 12, in verse 8, he says, You shall not do according to all that we are doing here today, everyone doing what is right in his own eyes. And we'll pick up that phrase and we'll find it several more times in the history of Israel where God will say, you want to know the reason things are going poorly? It's because you're doing what's right in your sight. You're not listening to me anymore. You're not seeing the things I see. And that illustrates to us exactly what it's like and not like to put our trust and our dependence in God. Sometimes that's difficult to do. You could drive down this street this morning and you could find lots of people telling you how to give up control of God to God in your life. But you would hear a lot of different answers to that. Sometimes people get discouraged. They'll say, well, everybody's got a different answer. Everybody else is saying something's right, something's wrong. How do I know? We realize it's a challenge, but what we must ultimately come to understand is that if we sincerely desire to know what's right, we've got to trust that God's going to show us that that God is going to help us to see what's best. Now, that leads us to our next thing that makes this so difficult. And that's the fact that it's very difficult to give God every part of our life. So once again, this may be a problem for the majority of us this morning who are Christians, who know right from wrong, who've made the decision to die with Jesus in the waters of baptism, and yet there are things in our life that we're tenaciously holding on to and saying, I'm going to keep control of this. I'm not going to give that over to God. And we sometimes do that by saying, well, there's a spiritual part of my life and there's a secular part. And God gets the Sunday part. I'm going to do exactly what He wants me to do on Sunday. But then when I'm at work, when I'm at the ball field, wherever I am, then I'll be making the decisions there. I can find nowhere where God says when you become a child of His, there's a portion of your life that's off limits to Him. Where He says, I don't have any right to tell you what to do or not to do. In fact, it's just the opposite of that. God says, when you become a child of mine, everything comes under the purview of God. We go to a familiar passage to make this point. When Jesus was asked for the greatest command, He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all, every bit of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. In other words, He's saying here that whether you're in this assembly, whether you're at work, whether you're at the ball field, whether you're at school, wherever it might be, what you are doing is you are rendering to me control of your decisions. You're going to make the decisions based on what I desire for you to do, even though that might not seem like the right thing at the time. You trust me in that. So then, everything comes under His control. But here's our problem. Sometimes we try to look spiritual without being spiritual. We'll say, okay, I understand this surrender. I understand what that means, and I'm going to do it. And from all outward appearances, maybe it looks that way, but deep down within us, we're still hanging on to something. Now, normally we would go to the passages that Jesus would speak on hypocrisy here, but I want to go to a different one. And I'm going to use the, uh, the New American Standard uh, Bible to, to reference this 
Because it's here, we're going to find where they choose the word surrender in that translation. And this is what they say in 1 Corinthians 13, 3. The apostle Paul writing, he says, If I give away all my possessions to charity, and if I surrender my body so that I may glory, but do not have love, it does me no good. I think sometimes we're so interested to get to the section on love defined that we miss what he's saying here. He's saying, if I try to put on this show, even to the point that I would allow myself to be martyred because of my faith, there can still be a problem there. If I begin to say things such as, I'll be remembered as a great saint. People, when they think of my name, they're going to think of someone who really stood up for the faith. Paul's saying, you're missing the boat on this thing. You're doing that for your own glory. You're doing that for your own will. And so what this means is the very powerful and challenging idea that when I surrender to God, I'm giving Him everything. Attitude, actions, everything comes under His control. And it means that when I do that, it's no longer my mind that's guiding these things, but it's the mind of Jesus Christ, as the Apostle would say. That we have the mind of Jesus. So then finally, I think one of the things that makes this surrender so difficult is that we oftentimes try to do it without God's help. So many times in our our spiritual journey, we tend to try to be spiritual without the spiritual God with us. No. I have to understand that it's the trust that God has promised grace and He's promised mercy and He's promised patience for us. And that there are going to be times when I am sorely tempted and sorely pressed to go back to my own way of thinking, and it's those very times I've got to trust in God that He's going to help me through it, and I've got to trust that in those times when I allow myself to go back into that old way of thinking, that God in His mercy is going to give me another day to live to come back into His fellowship once again. May I suggest to you this morning that this needs to be a constant in our prayers. Prayers can be awfully generic if we let them. We can come up with a few trite phrases and say them and and kind of feel like we were talking about earlier that we've done our thing, that we're spiritual people. But when you're really involved, your spirit with the Spirit of God and this fellowship and communication, it's going to be in those times that our neediness becomes so apparent. And when I look at how difficult it is for me to keep things out of my own control, to keep everything in the hands of God, I'm going to realize the exceptional need I have to ask for God's help in this. And I trust, as James tells us, that if we ask for wisdom, God is going to liberally provide. He's he's going to provide that, and He's not going to take responsibility away. But nonetheless, if we are praying for that strength, we can trust that it's going to be there. Let me also suggest this to you, that we look at how it's illustrated through the Bible. Whether in your daily Bible reading or something you're studying at the moment, likely you're not going to have to go too many pages where you see either a good or a bad example. Where someone is either turning control over to God, and maybe it's like King Jehoshaphat saying, just stand still and watch. Or, on the negative side, you come to an account like from a good man, Moses, where God said to speak and Moses struck. Whether the example is positive or negative, whether it's with someone who's struggling or someone who is just totally outside the bounds of God, the lesson is going to be there that every human is making this decision every day. 
the words we speak, the actions we take. We're making that every day. And what God has done is very generously provided all of these examples so that if we are being good students of His Word, we're seeing this on a daily basis and being fed with, it's going to be better if you turn control over to God. And finally, let me suggest to us that I need to have companions who are going to encourage this surrender. I don't ever want any of us to feel like we should not associate with people who aren't Christians. I, I think that's the most un-Jesus-like thing we can do. But it's with the understanding that if I choose my closest companions to be people who don't care much for God, there is going to be a strong temptation for me to abandon letting Him control my actions. Maybe that's going to be through some gentle rebuke or ridicule from our friends. Why don't you do this? It's just one whatever. So what I need to understand is that my light's got to shine. And, and I want to have associations with people from, from all walks of life to, to help to bring them to surrender their lives to Jesus. But for those who I'm considering as my counselors, my closest friends, the companions, I want these people to be those who are encouraging me to stay true to God. And I would suggest that's an important thing when we are young, and I would suggest that's an important thing when we're old. There is no point in our lives where we're totally uninfluenced by anybody else. And we need to make sure that we're with those people who are going to help us to be like God. So, let's sum up the terms of surrender. We can do it in one short parable in Matthew 13. Verses 45 and 46, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and he bought it. Here is someone who surrenders everything he owns so that he could have the most valuable thing of all. And that is surrendering to Jesus Christ. And when we do that, the promise is not that we'll get through this life with no bumps and bruises, but rather it will be that we'll get through this life to the life to come that will be totally victorious because of our unconditional surrender to a Lord who has given us the very best of terms for it. And this morning, if you're ready to make that surrender, the time is right. God's given you another day. And if that's being buried in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins, I hope you'll do that today. If we can pray with you about a problem or we can pray, go with you to God for forgiveness, we'll do that too. Whatever it takes, let's give our lives to Him so that He in turn will give us eternal life. If you need to respond, you can come now as we stand and sing together.